Does the Bible's reference to loving our neighbor as ourself mean we are to take in as many Islamic refugees as we can into America? What if that action results in a stealth invasion? That's next. Former Marine Staff Sergeant Steve Gern was working as a private security contractor in Iraq. Now he posted a video on Facebook talking about President Trump's temporary travel ban. It got more than 44 million views. The other morning, uh, we were having a discussion on the executive order, and a lot of the Iraqis obviously showed their uh, their displeasure in this executive order, why they feel like they've been betrayed by the United States and, and so on. I asked a simple question, and I got an answer to that simple question, and I got it without hesitation. The simple question was, as an American, if I went out in town right now, would I be welcome? They instantly said, absolutely not, you would not be welcome. What would happen if I went out in town? And they said, the locals would snatch me up and kill me within an hour. I'd be tortured first, and after they were done torturing me, I'd probably be beheaded. It would go on video for everybody to see as an example. The point I'm trying to make is, you know, this is the local populace that would do this. This isn't ISIS. This isn't Al-Qaeda. This isn't the PMU. This isn't a militia from the Iranians or anything like that. This is the local, the local populace that would do this. So my question to them was pretty simple then after that. If you would do this to me in your country, why would I let you in my country? Because all this means to me is that if you had the opportunity to take the life of an American, you would do it. So maybe that's something you all need to think about back there. If this is the way some of these cultures feel, this is the way that these countries feel about Americans, why would you be so naive to believe that if they came to the United States, they would do anything any different than what they would do right here in their own country? This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Today, Jan and Eric Barger meet with author and WorldNet Daily columnist Leo Holman. Leo's here to discuss his book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. Leo Holman says Americans are shocked by ongoing news reports chronicling growing chaos in Europe where massive Muslim migration is wreaking havoc on the continent. Yet few realize the USA is heading down the same suicidal path. This hour, Jan, Eric, and Leo will together review this immigration crisis and America's potential to repeat Europe's mistakes. To get us started, here's Jan Markell. And welcome to the program, and I'm so glad you could join me today. I'm going to be talking about a very current contemporary issue and a book. I'm going to reference it in just a minute, and I want to read from an opening page of this book to set the stage, and then I'll bring on my guest and my co-host. And the author says this, The one defining, devastating facet of this war, which he's calling World War III, is that only one side is engaged, only one side is on high alert, filing into the trenches and preparing themselves psychologically for the next battle. Most Americans are still under the false impression that we are at peace with the world. Europe may be in a crash-and-burn mode, but life in the United States is still business as usual. Oh, we have our problems, but they are nothing a new resident in the White House can't fix. I can't blame them, says the author here. This world war bears little resemblance to the first two which were fought with massive armies gathered on a single battlefield. The enemy in World War III is stealthy, blending in with the rest of us normal folks and operating on several fronts with an emphasis on patience and psychological tactics. It's difficult for most Americans to recognize these intermittent battles as one coherent war, and they definitely don't know where or when to expect the next attack. It could erupt in their city, their neighborhood mall, their favorite restaurant or bar, but usually it's in someone else's. They see only bits and pieces of this war, skirmishes here and there. It's hard to connect the dots. Okay, that is a couple of quotes or paragraphs out of Leo Homan's new book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. Now, here's why I have an interest in this, because I live in the part of the country that is called Little Mogadishu. Minnesota, and particularly the Twin Cities, has well over 100,000 Somalis, the largest population in America, and we have our challenges. Now, certainly not all are ill-intentioned, but too many women here in my area are harassed, dogs are beaten and killed, 
because they're considered unclean, and related issues, still Minnesota's liberalism welcomes more and more from unsafe lands, and few Americans in this part of the country feel safe. Uh, Eric Barger joins me as my co-host for this hour, and Leo Homan, welcome to the program for the first time. Thanks for having me on today, Jan. Happy to be here. Did it surprise you, Leo, when a uh, leftist judge uh, blocked Donald Trump's efforts to keep America safe? Now, this is several weeks ago, and then that was backed up by the Ninth Circuit Court. No, Jan, not really. We've seen the left mobilizing to an extent that we have never seen before. They are unified, it seems, at many different levels of our society right now, whether it be the media, the educational system, the court system. It's all being politicized. Rather than doing their job in the education system, for instance, I'm writing a story today about a school district in Georgia that's firing teachers if they speak out on social media, on immigration, speak their minds in in a way that would line up with the policies up Proving of the policies of President Trump. And so they're being fired, threatened and fired. And so it would not surprise me in the least that we would have federal judges coming out and instead of interpreting the Constitution and doing their job and staying within the bounds of the authority of the judicial branch, we see them becoming politicized. And everything under the Obama administration was politicized, yes. as you know. But, but Barack Obama had the same list of terror nations. Exactly. And he had even blocked refugees from Iraq for a period of six months when we found that two terrorists had slipped into the refugee ranks and ended up being resettled in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. He paused refugee resettlement from Iraq for six months. You never heard a peep out of the media or the court. President Jimmy Carter did the same thing during the Iran hostage crisis. And that travel ban lasted, I believe, more than a year. So, you know, it is a double standard. Different standard for President Trump than for all the other presidents. Okay, Leo, you say we are just a few years behind your And we have the same Christian and Jewish leaders falling all over these refugees when they have no idea what Islam teaches. I think that's an important statement you made. Yes, Jan, as you know, the Christian church in Europe post-World War II became very lukewarm, I guess to say the least, to the point where Europe basically became a post-Christian society. And that just opened the door for Islam and the migration policies that the governments of Europe implemented were conducive for Islam to exploit those lax immigration laws and to rush in to fill the gaps not only in the economy, because part of the thing that the leftists and globalists are always preaching in a post-Christian society is, what, abortion, family planning, have smaller families, have homosexual relationships are fine. Those are now resulting in sterile same-sex marriages. In Europe, the birth rate for women is now down to, like, 1.4 children per women in many countries well below replacement value. So in an environment like that, that does not desire to sustain itself or defend its culture, it's perfect for Islam to rush in and fill that vacuum. And that is what I see happening in America now. Fewer people, according to Pew Research and other major polls, believe in God in America than ever before. Still much stronger than Europe, our faith, culture, but it is slipping, and it is slipping fast. That sets the stage. But again, you make the statement that we have the same Christian and Jewish leaders falling all over these refugees when they have no idea what Islam teaches. And I mean, I felt that was a very profound statement. Yeah, part of that backsliding I was talking about is a lack of truth coming from the pulpit. Yes, uh, yes. Truth about the important issues of our time. As you know, we've had a awakening of the global Islamic movement over the, since 9-11, And uh, even before that, some people believe it started with the Iranian Revolution in 1979, and it's just been picking up steam ever since then. But yet you have the Christian church in these Western democracies of Europe and America not teaching their flock about what is Islam? What does it believe? Who do they believe that Jesus is? Did he die on a cross? Is he the Son of God? None of these are believed in the Islamic faith. And yet Christians, if you ask them these basic things about Islam, they would not know. Yep. I want to list the organizations that you list that are bringing in these refugees, because this goes back to Christian leaders again. These organizations that you list get a lot of taxpayer dollars to bring in these mm-hmm. 
migrants, these Im- immigrants. And folks, you are listening to Understanding the Times Radio, and I'm Jan Markell. I'm talking to Leo Homan, and his new book is Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. That's right, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. And, and here are the organizations being used to do this. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, Episcopal Migration Ministries, World Relief Corporation, which is an arm of National Association of Evangelicals, Church World Services, part of the World Council of Churches, the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, and then there are some others, perhaps less known, International Rescue Committee and a few other. There are about 10 here, 8 to 10. And and these folks get huge dollars. Is that correct? Yes. And don't forget the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, yes. which is another one. I believe six of the nine are affiliated with religious denominations. And so these organizations, as you said, present themselves as strictly humanitarian in nature, charitable, humanitarian, non-profit, do-gooding operations. What's not to like about that? Well, when they come into your community and start explaining why accepting refugees is going to be such a good thing and good for your community, and when they're quoted in the local newspapers, it's never pointed out that these are the exact same organizations that are profiting from the resettlement of refugees. They get paid over $2,000 for every refugee that they bring and resettle into the United States. And not only that, they get to keep about half of that, by the way. Okay, I did not Uh, know that. Not only that, and they're paid this money by the U.S. federal government. They're also paid by the government to collect travel loans from the refugees. Every refugee has to fly here and needs a plane ticket to get here from the third world. The refugee gets a loan to pay for that airfare, and then it's up to the resettlement agency, these nine organizations, to collect back from the refugee the cost of that airfare, and they get to keep a percentage of that in the way of a collection fee. Thirdly, they not only get paid in those two ways, they also get paid a third way. They offer services then to the refugees once they arrive in the United States. They can be these services, anything from how to improve your marriage to how to shop for healthy food, how to drive a car, how to do this, that, and the other. They're just unending services that they can provide to the refugees and get federal grants. So they have three ways of making money off of refugee, but yet we're never told when they're out there lobbying on behalf of refugee resettlement that it's in their financial interest to have more refugees every year come into the United Mm -hmm. States. If I thought being called a bigot because I have the same views that Leo does is something I can imagine the kind of heat that is coming his direction. And of course, that's just the way you you marginalize somebody. The reason people are sleeping today, and I really want to ask questions, but I can't help but comment here. Mm -hmm. We're sleeping because the media is so silent and even, well, not really silent. They're promoting. They're promoting. And that's why the American people don't realize what's going on. We don't necessarily, as Americans, just a rank and file American, have to know all the doctrines and problems of Islam and the history that has so many problems through it. But what we do understand is what they did in 9-11, and we've forgotten those things. Yeah. And uh, we've forgotten that if we don't vet these folks, that the bad guys are coming with them. And if I was a, a leader in ISIS, I would be doing everything possible to get the worst of the worst in the country now while the gate is still open. Talking to uh, Leo Homan, you can find his book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad at WorldNetDaily, WND.com. Just go to their store at WND.com. We don't carry it here at this ministry, but I want to play a quick soundbite. Brigitte Gabrielle kind of backing everything that Leo has said up until this point anyway. Are you watching what's happening in Europe with immigration and refugee issues? They are experiencing a mess that is beyond repair. Americans are concerned, and rightfully so, about who we are importing into our country and the ramification of their presence in our communities. Here's a shocker. Do you know that it is the United Nations Commission on Refugees who decides which refugees come to America? Yeah, you heard it correctly. They work with the State Department, who then works with nine federal contractors. Six of them are religious organizations, Christians and Jews, to resettle the refugees at the cost of $1 billion, not counting extra benefits like welfare. And where is this money coming from? Your pocket. The Treasury Department. The federal contractors use subcontractors to spread the refugees throughout America. 
Once they bring one refugee in, the process starts all over again to bring their extended family. It's a cash cow and everyone is jumping on the do-good wagon because of the millions of dollars they stand to make. To give you an idea, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service is 95% funded by your tax dollars. Their revenue for 2014 was 59 million and some change. Almost 57 million came out of your pocket. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Migration and Refugee Services is the largest private refugee resettlement agency in the U.S. In 2014, they brought in $85 million and some change. $82 million came from your pocket. We are literally paying good money to import bad problems Europe is already experiencing, such as sexual assault, terrorism, infectious diseases, and a clash of culture and values because most of the refugees we are importing are Muslims. Six states already in America reported cases of rape and sexual assault. Massachusetts, Idaho, Virginia, Utah, California, and North Dakota. While we see these cases as heinous attacks, they are often justified in the culture where they came from. Child marriages, child rape, child prostitution, especially the sexual abuse of little girls and women. When refugees are confronted, they say it is sanctioned in their culture and religion. Refugee cities have also become hubs for illnesses, such as highly infectious bacterial diseases, like active tuberculosis, that were once controlled, now mushrooming all over America. Colorado has 16 cases, Ohio 11 cases, Vermont 35, Wisconsin 117 cases. Most of them are drug resistant, which means it costs us the taxpayers 150000 per case and it takes 6 to 8 months to treat them. Florida, 11 cases, Idaho, 7, Indiana, 4, Kentucky, 9, and North Dakota, 4 cases. Refugee resettlement is not about humanitarianism, but about supplying cheap labor. Most refugees are on welfare of some sort, which makes anyone employing them eligible for the Federal Work Opportunity Tax Credit. An employer has a greater incentive to hire a refugee whose salary is subsidized by the taxpayer instead of hiring a struggling American. The food processing, meat packing, manufacturing, and the hotel industry are enjoying cheap labor at the expense of the U.S. taxpayer and cultural and social upheaval. It's companies like Chobani Yogurt, Tyson Foods, and Chipotle, just to name a few. So don't fall for the humanitarian mumbo-jumbo. Refugee resettlement is an industry driven by the importation of cheap labor and potential votes Police cut the baloney and the expense. Now let's talk about importing terrorism. We have at least had 10 cases of refugee Islamic terror arrests or convictions right here in America. Both Boston bombers, the Tsarnaev brothers, were refugees. Bombings in Manhattan and New Jersey were committed by a refugee. A Somali refugee went on a stabbing rampage at a Minnesota mall. Another one stabbed dozens on the Ohio State campus, to name a few. If the five top rich Islamic countries of the world, led by Saudi Arabia, have not let refugees in, because they are afraid of importing terrorism, then why are we? When are we going to stop being suicidal with our population? Leo Holman, I suspect you would agree with much of what Brigitte Gabriella of Act for America had to say. Yeah, she got so much in in about five minutes. I don't know how much is left for us to say. But yeah, she really hits the nail on, on the head there and knocked it out of the park. I mean, you know, this, this is a lot of the type thing that I document in my book with real life stories about what's been going on. Mm-hmm. You know, in places like Twin Falls, Idaho, it's just amazing. And then you have the media covering it up. And you bring out 60% of these folks going to be on food stamps. 60% will use Medicaid. Almost 50% are getting some kind of cash assistance. They're all getting subsidized housing. It's cradle to grave benefits both in the U.S. and Europe. And we need to continue our discussion. We're going to have to do it in our next segment here. And I, I want to ask you more specifically in that segment. Actually, I want to get into a little bit of a localized issue as I open this program with the Somalis in Minnesota, we've had about 40 of them arrested here locally for terror ties, and I'm sure that's going on in cities all across America. And then we have to talk a little bit later
year about 100 evangelical leaders who have come out and told us we have to welcome all of these refugees. And I'll say more about that uh, when we get into a later part of the programming. Folks, I'm coming back in a couple of minutes. Don't go away. World Net Daily writer Leo Holman's book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad, can be found at WND.com. Olive Tree Ministries' mission is to let everyone know the truth about the last days. Public information today can be so biased, too often it's spun to convey an agenda. It's rare to find ministries who only want constituents to be informed on current events from a biblical point of view. Olive Tree Ministries knows unless you keep informed on today's world through the lens of Scripture, the risk of being deceived will increase. Every weekend, we broadcast from coast to coast to help you and your family keep up to date on the issues facing Christians today. Every year, we bring thousands together for an Understanding the Times conference to hear the best speakers on issues facing the church. More details on this year's conference coming up. Don't forget, you can order an audio recording of today's program by calling 763-559-4444. You can also hear this program again when you visit olivetreeviews.org and click on the radio archive page. You can help support this ministry when you send your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We'll return shortly with our guests, but first, a word about our next fall conference. We are finalizing our 21st Understanding the Times Conference for October 7 at Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. Please consider joining us from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. There is no cost or registration needed, but you need to make hotel reservations early. Meet believers from across America who take our time seriously, but have a hope and expectancy many do not have. Our speakers include... Amir Sarfati. Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we that are alive will be caught up in the air. In other words, he was completely sure it's going to happen in his lifetime. And that's the way we should live, as if it is going to happen at any given minute. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And to me, that's a great picture of Bible prophecy for us. Knowing what's coming gives you peace of mind. And the, the Bible tells us that prophecy has a calming influence on our lives. Pastor J.D. Farag. That's not to be dismissive of the seriousness of what's happening in the world today. But thankfully, we have prophecy in the Bible that tells us not only what's going to happen at the time of the end, but why it's going to happen and where it's going to lead. And by the way, spoiler alert, we win. Michelle Bachman. These people don't give up. That's what we don't understand. That is everything for them, is their strategy to get to one world government. And they will do anything, including lawless actions, to get there. Visit our website for details, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Or call us at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. 44. Helping you stay informed on issues that could change your life. Former Marine Staff Sergeant Steve Gurn was working as a private security contractor in Iraq. And joining us now to share his story is Steve Gurns. How do you ever positively ascertain what is in somebody's heart if they want to come to America, if they want to come here for freedom, or they want to come here to proselytize, or they want to come here to, to hurt Americans and blow up a school or a mall or whatever? You, you're really not going to be able to. And, and the, what I have learned over the years of, of working in Iraq and Afghanistan is they're very good at manipulation. They can manipulate just about anyone and they're really good at it so they can tell you what they you know what they want you to hear and they can keep that up for many many years and then eventually when it's time they'll do what they believe is right and if that is yeah. to you know hurt an American or, or hurt many of us at one time they're going to do it today's understanding of the times broadcast features author Leo Holman and his book stealth invasion Muslim conquest through immigration and resettlement jihad. Jen Markell, Eric Barger, and Leo continue to review the issues of immigration in America. Now let's go back to their conversation. 
And welcome back. And I think everyone is very well aware, almost painfully aware, of the issues regarding immigration, the fact that we have a president who actually wants to keep America safe. And, of course, many of us were very troubled, have been troubled over the last many months and years, the fact that all the immigrants coming from the Middle East are Muslims, about 0.5% are Christians, and they are the truly the persecuted ones. And yet the previous administration focused only on Muslims, bringing hundreds of thousands of Muslims into the country. So I was extremely interested to see the new book by Leo Homan, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad, and Michelle Bachman has an endorsement. Leo has brilliantly researched a book that is well worth your time. Read Stealth Invasion to learn how you can play an effective role in protecting your backyard. That's Michelle Bachman, and I said opening the program, and Michelle and I both live in what's known as Little Mogadishu. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the program winds down here. But Leo Homan, we talked about the nine organizations that are backing all of this, and yet they are not allowed to share the gospel. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. They sign a contract, Jan, with the U.S. State Department, these nine volunteer agencies, also called VOLAGs, of which six of them are religiously based. They sign a contract with the U.S. State Department agreeing not to proselytize any of the refugees that they resettle in our cities and towns. And this just sort of adds, in my opinion, to the lack of assimilation that the Muslim refugees in particular are failing to accomplish. They're living in enclaves in places like Minneapolis and Columbus, Ohio, and Seattle, and Atlanta, and San Diego, and they're not getting out and assimilating with the rest of our country and being exposed to anything but their own narrow Islamic culture. Leo, that's exactly right. Can you tell me of one instance from history where Muslim immigrants have ever truly assimilated in mass in a Western setting? That is a great question. No, I mean, there's some in process that they would tell you, well, we're in the process and we think we're going to be successful, but they certainly have not been successful yet. You take Sweden as a good example. Sweden was a nice, calm, docile, peaceful place to live, very leftist in nature, welfare state, but very little crime in that country. It was one of the most peaceful countries in the world. And after a couple of decades of widespread resettlement of Somalis and other refugees from the Islamic world, Sweden is now the rape capital of Europe, That's right. amazingly. So it's gone from one side of the spectrum to the other, a 190-degree turn. And they are not only facing a lot of sexual assaults and rapes, but they're facing a lot more violent crime. They've had rioting in the streets of a suburb of Stockholm. It's now certain places you cannot go in that town unless you take your life very lightly, and especially if you're a woman. So the same thing is now happening in Germany, where women are being told to cover up when they go out in public because you'll just be stimulating the demons within some of the migrants that have flooded into that country, okay. having to separate men and women in spas and public pools in some of these places in Sweden, in Germany. You've heard about the migrant sex grooming gangs mm -hmm. and running wild in the UK. Places like Rotherham, England have seen just hundreds of small girls, 11 to 13, 14 years old, brutally brought into these rape gangs where they pass them around from brother to brother, cousin to cousin, and it's just disgusting what's happened there, and the media tried to cover that all up. Leo, is there any Finally reason out. we should think that this won't come to America? Uh, right. We're, we're told that America is somehow different. When the migrants come to America, they just kiss the ground and suddenly become great constitutional Americans with full respect for the Bill of Rights. It's just absurd. We're starting to see the uh, first fruits of that absurd thinking. We've had a, a rape of a small girl, five-year-old special needs girl in Twin Falls by three right. refugee boys from Sudan and Iraq. We've had a uh, refugee from Somalia attack a woman, try to sexually assault 
killed her in Aberdeen, South Dakota recently, and the media there tried to cover that up. WND, myself, covered that story, and then the local paper was forced to acknowledge, oh, we just missed that one in the courts, and they hurriedly put together a story that didn't even say that the migrant, that he was a refugee or that he was Muslim. Leo, my producer would like to ask a question. Leo, it's really interesting, all of these rapes. I mean, here you've got a religion that is actually doing the raping. Why is it? What's the DNA in Islam that is allowing them to take it to that degree? Great question, Larry. These refugees arrive here in America and in the West with a lot of baggage. They're taught from the time they were small boys that a respectable woman is a Muslim woman. And a Muslim woman, a true Muslim woman, not just somebody who says they're Muslim like a lot of people in America, but a true Muslim will cover her head, her hair, and her body. She will wear a hijab. She will lower her gaze when she comes into the presence of a male stranger. And in many countries, she's not even allowed to leave the house without a male companion that is related to her, her father, brother, or husband. And so when they get here to America, and they hear a lot of things about America before they even arrive here, and they have all this baggage, and they're told that, you know, it's just a free-for-all in Europe and in America. The women are all promiscuous. The men have no integrity. And it's an open society. And it's just get what you can take. Your non-Muslim women are considered basically wanting it if they're not dressed in a traditional garb like they're used to in their home countries. And so this is the problem, Larry, that we're now experiencing in the Western democracies when we're bringing in large numbers of these male Muslim refugees and we're not expecting any sort of assimilation. They're not told what the rules are up front and what the penalty is and what the laws are. And so we have problems. I want to build on what you're saying, Leo, and you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have uh, Leo Homan on the line I'm talking about his new book, Stealth Invasion. Eric Barger joins me today. I have a very short three-minute clip because Fox News came to our little Mogadishu. That's what parts of the Twin Cities are called. That's where I headquarter. Pete Hegseth did a six, seven-minute feature. We're only going to play three minutes as he kind of roamed the Islamic community in the Twin Cities and tried to get some information from our local residents. And I think this backs up what we've talked about here for the first part of the program. We're back with the story. The mastermind behind a disturbing plot for ISIS in Syria will spend 35 years in prison. 22-year-old Ghulid Omar sobbing before a Minneapolis judge on Friday, claiming to be a changed man. Well, he is the last of a nine-person terror cell to be sentenced. Earlier this year, this guy named Pete Hegseth visited a neighborhood of Minneapolis known as Little Mogadishu, an area considered by some as ground zero for ISIS recruitment right here inside America. That's right. And Minnesota has been a hotbed for terror recruitment. But why? Why has this happened? Where, where does it come from? So I hit the streets of Minneapolis to check it out. Terror connection leading right back to the Twin Cities. Federal authorities say that a man's been arrested on terror-related charges. Major concerns in the Somali community over a terror recruitment video that was released by al-Shabaab. It's often the lead story in the Twin Cities. Terror recruits coming from Minnesota, where thousands of Somalis relocated after civil war ripped their country apart in 1991. We're here in the Cedar Riverside area of Minneapolis, what some call Little Mogadishu. These towers have long been a symbol of a very large Somali Muslim population here in Minneapolis. What some would say an increasingly insular Muslim population. Pretty much everybody here is nice. They love this country. The worst propaganda is by news media, biased against you know all Muslims. And some people are targeting Muslims. Because I'm Muslim, it doesn't mean that I'm terrorist. Of more than 200 Islamic schools in the United States, at least two, likely more, are located in Minnesota. American government is listed as a subject at one of these schools. The Islamic schools in here in Minnesota, they teach Sharia law? Yeah, Sharia law. And what do they teach also American law, the U.S. Constitution? Mm, actually, I have no idea about that one. While many first-generation Somalis come to America looking for a better life, we had a hard time finding people in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood who spoke English. We're here with Fox News just doing a story about the Riverside area. No English? Any, any at all? No? Just wanted to see if I could ask you a couple quick questions. No English. Would you be willing to chat with us? No, it's a language. Uh, no English? No English. You go there and you see someone who's been there for like 20 years and he or she doesn't speak a single word of English because they don't interact with people outside that circle. It creates an environment where the lone wolf is going to be easier to hide in. Omar Jamal is an outspoken community leader in Minneapolis. Is radicalization still going on right now? Are Somali youth still being recruited by ISIS as we speak? 
Yes. National security expert Ryan Murrow has investigated radical mosques across the country and says terror recruits, most of them second generation immigrants, feel isolated from society. One of the critical factors in ISIS propaganda is saying that you belong in the caliphate and your life will be better under the caliphate. You'll get free health care, the social services will be wonderful, we'll all treat you as friends and family members, uh, we'll hook you up with a husband or a wife. And so they have this illusion that the caliphate is a wonderful thing, then they go over there and then they see the truth. At least two young people who worshipped at the Al Farouk Mosque in Bloomington, near Minneapolis, have attempted to join terror organizations. Leah Holman, you actually covered a story uh, based out of the Twin Cities. You write for WorldNet Daily, WND.com, who's published your book. You covered the story of a Minnesota Twin Cities woman uh, harassed by these Somalis. I did, and I included even an expanded version of that story in yes. my book, Stealth Invasion. And what I found in that incident was a group of a 12 to 15 Somali youth thugs arriving at this posh neighborhood on Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis for three consecutive days. They ran their cars throughout the neighborhood at high rates of speed over neighbors' lawns, shouting jihad as they were going. They pulled uh, their duffel bags out with things inside the duffel bags disguised as guns as though they were like shooting a machine gun at people. And then the worst part came on the day when they started to harass a young woman in her 30s who was taking her garbage out as they came by, and they told her that they basically liked the way she looked and that they wanted to take her as a wife. And when she said, no, I'm sorry, I have a husband, they said, well, according to Sharia law, we, we can rape you. And then the next night they came through and started playing loud music in their vehicles with a tape recording, which she said sounded like a woman being raped. It was horrific. There's no other word for it. One TV station covered it with one report, did not follow up on it. And your local newspaper there, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, chose to ignore it altogether. Yes. We've heard that same story from pastors in Southern California who've told us about neighborhoods being invaded in the same way. Yeah. And gentlemen, and yet we have here very recently 100 evangelical leaders addressing President Trump and Vice President Pence appealing for Muslims to be able to choose America as a refuge. And they say that the Bible suggests that our care for the oppressed and suffering is rooted in the call of Jesus to love our neighbor as ourselves. They insist our neighbor includes the stranger and anyone fleeing persecution. And this was spurred on, these 100 evangelical leaders very recently, spurred on by the organization known as World Relief, which is an arm of the National Association of Evangelicals. And we maintain, because we said earlier in the program, these outfits cannot share the gospel with these Muslims. So, Eric, is this just rooted in social justice because uh, of the ban on on, on witnessing? Jan, that's, this is exactly what it is. And when, when these folks claim that they're going to be able to share the gospel, and this is all about proselytizing Christianity to these folks, first of all, as we've already pointed out, it's illegal for them to do that. And secondly, I want to know what they mean when they say the words the gospel. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to them? We see the postmoderns, emergence, and liberals. They've redefined everything else that has to do with Christianity, including who God is. Well, what does it mean to share the gospel? Is it just to give a cup of water? Is it just to help the needy? We want to help people. My heart breaks when I see those who are innocent in the midst of this. It's one of the truly terrible byproducts of war and of terrorism yes. in this case. But let's vet them. And that's what these Christian leaders have decided not to do. What good can I be if I help someone at my door and the next person that walks up has a bomb? Then I can help no one after That's that. Exactly I'm right. torn apart. My family's torn apart. And uh, as well as the whole of the country sees those things, the media is quick to come to a place where a bombing or some terrorist event has taken place. But they're not very quick to point out exactly why this is going on. And that's because we have leaders out there who have opened the door in the last administration. And we have leaders out there who have made the way for others to make a lot of money on this at the same time. Okay, here's what these 100 evangelical leaders say. We can only spend a second on it. As Christian pastors and leaders, we are deeply concerned 
concern by the recently announced moratorium on refugee resettlement. Our care for the oppressed and suffering is rooted in the call of Jesus to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus makes it clear that our neighbor includes the stranger and anyone fleeing persecution and violence, regardless of their faith or country. Some of the signers, it's a long proclamation. I can't read it all. Again, it's spearheaded by World Relief, which is an arm of National Association of Evangelicals. Other signers, there are many, many. Tim Keller, Bill and Lynn Hybels, Ed Stetzer of Wheaton College, Max Licato, the National Association of Evangelicals, Stuart and Jill Briscoe, Joel Hunter, the Christian Reformed Church in North America, the Evangelical Covenant Church, Open Doors USA, Richard Mao, Fuller Theological Seminary. I could go on and on and on. Every imaginable denomination or denomination head has signed this. And again, if in fact, if you can't share the gospel with these people, and the other side of the coin is, Leo, we're at putting Americans at great danger. I can't make all this compute. Jan, this letter that you're reading is just the height of absurdity from these Christian leaders. It's a straw man argument is what it is. It's a false narrative because what they're saying is that in order to be compassionate and to be Christian, we must permanently resettle tens of thousands of Muslim refugees from the third world into over 300 U.S. cities and towns. That's a straw man argument, Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. We could be doing more for these people where they are by reaching out to them where they are than by bringing a few of them here. Let's just take Syria as one example. There are five million refugees or displaced people as a result of the Syrian civil war, people that have been run out of their homes, Christians and Muslims. There are only 350,000 of those who are marked by the UN to be resettled in Western democracies. So what is 350,000 out of 5 million? It's a drop in the bucket. Mm. And yet if you listen to what these Christians are saying, you would think that it's a zero-sum game, Mm. and it all rests, our identity as compassionate Christians rests on our ability to resettle a few thousand every year. It's about 40,000 every year that come through refugee resettlement into America. That is a false argument. There's been a study done by the Center for Immigration Studies that shows we could help 12 refugees where they are in camps, that we could protect them with no-fly zones. We could help 12 of them there in the region, in the Middle East, for what it costs Mm -hmm. for us to resettle one here in the United States. And so not only are we not helping enough if this is the way to do it, like they say, but we also could help way more in a cost-benefit analysis by helping them where they are. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be compassionate. I'm saying my argument is permanently resettling these people in Western societies where they don't fit and don't want to assimilate is not the answer. We're going to pick this up in our closing segment. I am totally out of time in this one. Back in just a couple of minutes. Every weekend, Understanding the Times Radio lights up the airwaves and the Internet with the inconvenient truth. Nationwide, we're talking about the issues facing America and the church. We're sounding an alarm intended to awaken you to the lateness of the hour. It's our prayer that those who've listened for years will be challenged to join us financially as our partners to help ensure this kind of programming continues to reach America every weekend. Please send your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give online at olivetreeviews.org or by phoning 763-559-4444. We'll be right back. I have often called Understanding the Times Radio, Radio for the Remnant. Around the world, people have had enough of fake news, slanted news, and evidence that good people are marginalized and unappreciated. That is why this program focuses on the truth and the ultimate good news. If you would like to keep it coming to your neighborhood, please consider a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries. Give online at olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can call us, business hours, central time. 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. Or just drop us a note. 
you can't financially support, let us know we make a difference in your life. Write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Help us look at today, but with another eye on tomorrow and the ultimate hope that awaits us. Intelligence officials saying terrorists may be using last year's attack in San Bernardino, California, as inspiration. Yeah, and the key is even more than inspiration. Possibly taking an alarming step forward from inspiring attacks like last year's shooting in San Bernardino to actively directing and coordinating attacks on U.S. soil like those attacks in Paris in November. The director of national intelligence and director of the Defense Intelligence Agency warning Congress that ISIS is determined to bring terror to the U.S. homeland. Understanding the Times, today featuring WorldNet Daily, Leo Holman continues. With our final segment, here's Jan Markell. Welcome back. I read cover to cover a book by Leo Holman, put out by WND.com, WorldNet Daily, Find It There, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. Leo Holman is the author. He's with me. Eric Barger's in studio with me. We're in a short segment here, gentlemen. We haven't talked about Hijra. And Leo, you said to me off air, you said to me, none of these Christian leaders know anything about Hijra. Talk to us about it quickly. Yes, Hijra, I believe, is the key to the whole ball of wax here that we've been talking about. We talk about how many are coming. We talk about their lack of assimilation. We talk about how we could help more where they are in the Middle East if we were really concerned about a compassionate Christian response. But what we have failed to talk about so far and what I don't believe these Christian leaders have any inkling or knowledge of is the Hijra. The Hijra is an Islamic doctrine that goes all the way back to Muhammad that is second in importance only to jihad when it comes to the points that you can get from Allah when you go on to the next life. If you die, as you know, on jihad, you get an immediate pass into paradise. If you die while you're on hijra, it is second only to jihad on that level. So hijra is a method of spreading Islam to non-Islamic lands through migration. And that's all the word means. Hijra is Arabic for migration. And it is a sacred doctrine in Islam. And that is something Christian leaders must understand. And I explained it in my book. Yes. I talked to a you former did. imam, Dr. Mark Christian, who is from Cairo, Egypt, yes. son of a Muslim Brotherhood father. And he is a brilliant scholar about Islam. Islam, and he exposes this in my book. Leo is exactly correct about this. And to me, you know, we talk about how much more efficient it would be and helpful to help those who are in need if we did so over in the lands where they live. But that would negate them being able to come here and follow the Hijra and follow the, the, the admonition that the Quran gives. They must do this. Leo, do you hold out any hope that our government, our politicians, especially in the new administration, are going to be able to, I want to say, pull this off, but be able to stop this? You know, when they have the media you beating on them and every I mean they can't take a breath without the media disrupting their lives do you believe that the administration can somehow with the control of Congress get a grip on this the problem is going to be largely Congress, Eric. Many of our Republican leaders in Congress, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell and these type, John McCain, they're on the take from the Muslim Brotherhood. They are bought and paid for by groups like CARE and ISNA, and they have no intentions of solving this problem, and so they will work against President Trump every opportunity they have. Let so, me break in on you. That That's a very heavy thing to say, and I know you could back that up, or you'd never make that statement. Is it that their campaigns are being financed? Is that what's going on? Mr. Paul Ryan has accepted it last year $1,000 from CARE. I know that for a fact, which is a one-time donation from an individual who was associated with CARE. That's a rather large, that would be like you giving $1,000 to a campaign, a congressional campaign. That's a rather large donation. And so, yes, and John McCain as well has received money from individuals connected to CARE and other Muslim Brotherhood affiliated organizations. And so, no, that is, that is not something I just made up. It is true, and there's many others. The Democrats are even more heavily financed by Muslim Brotherhood entities. 
but we do have enough in the Republican Party for it to be a concern, especially when your Speaker of the House is one of yes. them. Yes, it's going to be an upheld challenge, but people need to be in contact with their congressmen and to let them know that we should, above all else, declare the Muslim Brotherhood mm-hmm. a terrorist organization. Amen. There's a bill in yep. Congress yep. to do just that. Little wonder that Mr. Paul Ryan has not advanced that bill. Don't expect him to unless he comes under intense pressure from both constituents and perhaps President Trump, but President Trump could do this on his own, I'm told, as well. And you also bring out, Leo Homan, in your book, you talk about, again, the global elites, the one-worlders. We just did a whole program on that recently here with Gary Kahn. Absolutely, yeah. and that the bottom-line goal of that group is a borderless world. Yes. The free flow of labor across open borders. And that is another thing that people like Paul Ryan are just openly in favor of. I mean, they're trying to uh, be more judicious in the way they talk about it now that they know that most people are, you know, not on on board with that type of philosophy. But if you look at his history, everything on immigration that he has stood for has been towards open borders. One world government, one world system, no borders, single currency. Hey, it's in the Bible, folks. We talk about it all the time. Read Revelation 13 and other places. Yeah, we do read it uh, elsewhere in the scriptures, and it's all through the scriptures, and we're watching it happen right before our eyes. I was thinking as Leo was talking about what's happened in Europe and what is about to happen or what could happen here, just thinking about the way this reforms and reshapes everyone and everything around us. And it looks to me like between the government and the media, the two of them are, are really on a binge to make this happen. I mean, that's what we've been talking about. But it's it's like it struck me. This changes the thinking I had as a little boy growing up in West Virginia or you, Jan, where you grew up or Leo, where he grew up. It changes everything about the way we think about the world if we introduce a religion that cannot assimilate in this way, in this magnitude here in America. Leo, you bring out the fact that a new mosque opens every week in America. We have so many springing up in Minnesota. It's, it's just stunning. Even They're even opening in Alaska. And, yeah. and then you bring out that it, Europe is expected to be completely Muslim in 10 years. Well, you know, those are predictions. Whether or not they'll come true or not remains to be seen. But there was a recent prediction, I think, even since my book was published by an archbishop uh, of Pompeii in Italy, Monsignor Carlo Liberati, who said, point blank, he predicted Europe will be Muslim within 10 years. And he said, it's, quote, because of our stupidity, unquote, we have a weak Christian faith. He said all of the moral and religious decadence favors Islam. We need a true Christian life. All this paves the way to Islam. In addition, he said, they have children and we don't. They can have three and four wives, too. Right. Islam must control the whole earth. That's the way they feel anyway. It's the fastest growing movement in the world. And, you know, and you bring out, Leo, the fact that it kind of required Barack Obama to further this catastrophe. I mean, he lectured Christians about guns and Bibles. He was a defender of Islam. He oversaw Islamic teachings into common core. He put up barriers to true refugees, such as Christians. Ninety-nine percent, I think, are Muslims coming in. From Syria. From Syria. A little bit higher from some of the other countries. Yeah. And many politicians that we've just discussed here place us on a path to national suicide. We've even got, we talked about, 100 evangelical leaders putting us on a path to, to suicide. So I think all of us are hopeful that a new president, Donald Trump, can make a difference. And I know you raised that question, Eric, and I, I hope and pray that he can. But then we get the pushback from the judges and from the Court of Appeals. And Americans throw their hands up and say, I give up. Yes, absolutely. And one thing that I bring out in my book, Jan, is that what I call an unholy alliance between the secular globalist left and the religious Islamist globalists. They have a lot in common. At first, you wouldn't think so. One is fundamentally religious, the Islamists, and then the other is worldly and secular. What do they have in common? Well, they both are for a global system. Islamists want a global caliphate. The leftists want a global government based on a one-world order that you talked yep, about. Good point. And they have also common enemies. That's true. Their common enemy is Christianity and Judeo-Christian values. Right. They cannot succeed in their global vision with a strong Christianity. Okay, we've presented some huge problems this hour, and I'm running out of time here, but uh, Leo, do you have uh, perhaps a solution? The solution, Jan, as you know as well as I do, 
is a strong Christianity. Archbishop Liberati, I just gave that quote, wonderful quote from him about the weak, we have a weak Christianity. I'm afraid the same thing has happened in many of our American churches. If we have strong churches and a strong Christianity, that is the best antidote to a rising Islam in any culture. Islam looks for weak Christianity, Mm -hmm. and it rushes in to fill the void. Right, but then we've got a hundred evangelical leaders who say we must cave to these people. And they represent... Right. We have to ignore our 100 evangelical right. leaders. Exactly what I was going to say, Jan. We just need to forget what any Christian leader is saying and go back to the Scriptures and follow the Bible. Right. You know, this is a spiritual war. If I have a final comment, it's please, that. Please, please. And it is a spiritual war being played out in the natural. It is end-time events that we see taking place. Prophecy is all around us. Yes. Keep your eyes open. Watch for the Messiah. But while you're here, work and don't give up. That's where I've always come from on these issues. And listen to spiritual enlightened Christian leaders like Franklin Graham. Well, folks, I just want to wrap this up again. You can find the book Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad by Leo Homan. WND.com. Go to their superstore. I've read it cover to cover. I don't often have time to do that, but it was gripping. It's got, and again, I live in Little Mogadishu, but Little Mogadishu is coming to you. I it's guarantee coming. it. I guarantee it. If yeah. we don't step in and do something. I think back to 2 Timothy 3, where it talks about the last days being perilous times, and my goodness, aren't they perilous times? I just think of the verse in the Psalms, I trust in you, O Lord, our times are in your hands. And again, we put this crisis in the Lord's hands, that's all we can do. I want to thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. We are a moment You are forever, Lord of the ages, God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Thank you for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. We continue to reach the world by reporting current events from a biblical perspective, costing us thousands of dollars. This listener-supported program is delivered each weekend nationwide and into your home. You can help us produce and distribute this broadcast. We invite you to partner with this ministry. With our ever-changing world, men and women of faith need to be aware of current events as reported and discussed through the lens of Scripture. With the blessed hope in view... Week after week, Jen Markell brings you compelling guest interviews to highlight the dangers in today's world. To become our broadcast partner, please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also help underwrite this program safely and securely at olivetreeviews.org or when you phone 763-559-4444. We're looking forward to hearing from you this week. And please continue to pray for the Olive Tree Ministries team for daily global updates with a biblical worldview. 24 hours a day, log on to olivetreeviews.org. Next week, Jan returns with another program designed to help you understand the times.